Well, hey everybody, welcome to this Photoshop tutorial brought to you by tutvid.com. Today I want to talk about 10 things that in my mind are must no features for photographers in Photoshop. It was a little difficult putting this list together because I could have gone very basic and just gone with like baseline here. You got to know this about adjustment layers or sharpening or smart objects or whatever. I decided just to pick 10 things that I have found have either changed the way that I have worked as a photographer in Photoshop uh, or just been like massively helpful in various and sundry types of ways. Let's jump in and check out the 10 things that I think you ought to know if you're a photographer using Photoshop in any capacity. Let's get started. Now, number one, I want to talk about lifting the black point or uh, tweaking contrast and tone with, with levels, with curves, and with um, selective color. So... It's a very like Instagrammy type effect, but it can really lead to being able to do a lot of different color grading treatments and things like that when you're working with your photography. And it can just be fun to play with even if you don't end up using it. Let's try levels first here. Add a levels adjustment layer. You lift the black point by dragging the black output slider. Not the input slider, not the one that cranks up contrast. This one kind of decreases contrast. See how it's like flattening out the photo, reducing contrast. You can actually incidentally also drop the white point if just your whites are just too, too much. Uh, we can also go to like blue here and just crank some blue into those shadows. And you can see we start to get this very, um, you know, just very blues in the shadows, faded type of look. Let's shut that off. Let's try doing it with the curves adjustment layer. Curves is, uh, I mean, it looks very different, but the principles are the same. You've got your black point. If we lift the black point here by clicking on this point, just dragging it, you can see we lift just, we take the, we take all the black, in the image and just say look you darkest of black pixels in the photo become more like you know 90% gray you'd be surprised at what that does to your photo it it really kills off a lot of contrast uh, but it gives you this faded washed out look one of the things we can do though to combat this is we can like pull down here on our mid-tones make these a little bit darker maybe like bring this bring this uh the darks up even a little bit more right let's go a little crazier Photoshop's behaving a little, responding a little slow here for me. You can see we've really washed this out. His skin looks really red and yellow though. So I could go to like my color channels, go to like the blue channel. We're going to keep this quick and easy. So just hit the little finger roll tool. We know what do we want to do? We, uh, well, yellow is the opposite of blue. Therefore, we want to boost some blue in his skin. So I'm going to click and drag upward a little bit. There we go. It doesn't look too pink, but maybe there's a little bit too much magenta in his skin. Now magenta is the opposite of green. So to get rid of magenta, what do I do? Well, I add green. So I'm going to click like here on the bridge of his nose where it's very very red. I'm going to drag upward, introduce a little green. I don't want to introduce too much green because that's going to look really, really bad on his skin. Just a little bit. We're just looking to combat and just kind of ping the magenta a little bit. And then we'll finish the magenta off by reducing the reds a little bit. So again, grab that finger roll tool and just pull down a little bit to get rid of some of those reds. And look at that really cool skin tone. There's before, there's after. We've totally changed the tone and color of the photo. And we've just given it this very washed out, faded look. I don't know. It's really neat. I just kind of, I kind of dig it. And by the way, you can do a lot of those same things uh, by utilizing the color channels here in your levels adjustment layer as well. The last uh, little adjustment layer I want to look at is selective color here. This is a sleeper. Down here at the bottom of the colors, you have whites, neutrals, and blacks. If you go to blacks, you can just straight up reduce the amount of black in black. So if I reduce the blacks that are in blacks, you can see I get this really faded effect. One of the things I can also do is play with cyan, magenta, yellow. Now remember, the opposite of yellow is blue. Opposite of magenta is green. Opposite of cyan is red, RGB, C-M-Y-K. Um, so if I want to like put more blue in the shadows, I get rid of yellow. So I pull back on my yellow slider. So I'm getting this really cool blue up there. I can just introduce a little magenta as well to just kind of give it a little kiss of oomph. And then I can either increase or decrease the cyan depending on the style. I'm going for and we get just a number of different toned images uh, all done in very different ways with very different adjustment layers so lifting the black point and tweaking contrast and tone with levels curves and selective color I think immensely helpful and useful and there's so many things you can do with these adjustment layers I just had to throw this in and lead off with this tip and I think what we should do is talk about luminosity masks next luminosity masks are this is going to be a king for you, especially if you're a landscape photographer, as of course I switch over here to a portrait of my friend Chelsea. Uh, what we want to do is target the highlights. We know that like the highlights in her face need to be brightened and spruced up a little bit. We're going to create a very simple luminosity mask to target just the highlights in her face. Now, you could be saying, hey, you can go select color range and just try to select that stuff in her face, really redu reduce the fuzziness. And you can see you're going to get 
a reasonable selection. And you can even come in here and just say like, hey, choose the highlights. And then you can, you know, restrict or increase the level of, of highlights. Um, I've never, I don't know, it's never really come to me naturally doing it that way. I've been doing it using channels for the longest time. And I love what you can do with channels. Over here in the channels, uh, 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 the channels panel, you can load a channel as a selection by hitting command option and the number of the channel. So like command option two, uh, I'm sorry, not just the channel, but the, the luminosity, the, the luma values of this image, if you will, are what are being loaded here in the composite RGB channel when I hit command option or control alt and the number two. So I've loaded this as a selection. You can see see like her dress is almost entirely selected it's very bright it's white most of the stuff appear on her forehead great we've got some bright spots on the rocks behind her wonderful how do i make this a selection that's saved well create a new uh alpha channel here hit command or control i to inverse your uh to invert excuse me the colors within that selection hit command or control well, i don't want to actually deselect don't hit anything just that, and you can see we have what looks like it's not really quite the red, green, or blue channel. It's a little bit different than all of them. We can actually restrict this a little bit more, though, by holding down our Command Shift Option keys. That'd be Control Shift Alt on the PC, and click the RGB composite channel again. You can see it's restricting even more. So let's create a new channel again. Hit Command or Control I, and you can see it's a little bit darker. That's kind of cool. Let's hold down Command Shift Option or Control Shift Alt and click RGB once more. And we're going to create another new channel, Command or Control I, to flip the colors. And now I'm just going to deselect Command or Control I because I've got a really restricted channel. Remember, if we were to convert this to a mask straight up, white is the stuff that shows through. So in theory, we're going to get a ton of adjustment applied to her dress and a little bit applied to kind of like the brighter parts of her skin and less and less as it falls off, like here in the sockets of her eyes or in between her lips or beneath her nose. I'm going to use alpha 3, so I'm actually going to load this as a selection, command or control, and just click on the thumbnail for that. I'm going to turn my composite channel back on, select it. The red overlay, it's because we still have alpha 3 selected. Hit the little eyeball to shut that off. Go back over to layers, and let's try applying, um, let's just go with a curves adjustment since we already were messing around with curves. And I'm going to pull up on this. And you're going to see her dress is going to get brighter, yes, but we're also seeing the side of her face change. So one of the things I can do here is I can just close my properties panel and maybe I really don't want to affect her dress at all, uh, in which case I can either go into my curves uh, mask here or well, I probably won't do that. Let's just grab the brush tool. Let's keep it simple. A big soft edge brush. You can right click and just go you know, 500 pixel soft edge brush. Make it even a little bit bigger if you want. Paint with black and I'm going to paint over her dress with this large soft edge brush and it's going to get rid of basically all of the brightening effect. You can see over here in the mask I've painted over this with black and I'm just getting rid of any bit of adjustment that's going to be messing with or altering uh, the brightness values of her dress. Uh, so if I alt or option click on my mask, I can now see, well, maybe I can just clean that stuff up a little bit. I can now see the stuff that's actually being affected. In fact, I can come here under the skin just beneath her neck and I can even come up uh, beside her face as well. So really our curves adjustment is applying a little bit of the rocks just because we're kind of too lazy to go in there and paint that stuff away, but mainly her face. I can alt or option click on the mask to get back out to my normal view. And if I shut my curves layer off, turn it back on it's just a nice little pop in the highlights very subtle very beautiful subtlety is what you want lots of little subtle tweaks and adjustments when you're retouching your photos is going to equal a great photo in the end it's the massive sweeping changes like think liquefy to like make somebody's butt huge it always looks terrible it just it, it looks flat and funky and the stuff around it is all messed up and distorted you know subtlety if you do lots of subtle liquefication changes all of a sudden you can shape and craft somebody's body into something really beautiful same thing when we're attacking highlights and shadows. This is not the only place. I mentioned that this is great for uh, landscape photography. So I get this photo from Vermont. The sky is well exposed for the dynamic range in this scene was huge. I was shooting with um, just a standard DSLR camera and I, I wasn't able to get an exposure that exposed the foreground as beautifully as I saw it and didn't blow out the sky. So I, I chose a point in the middle where I knew that my sky was going to be exposed for properly and I figured I could come in and use luminosity masks to bring uh, brightness and contrast back to the foreground. 
Here's how we do this. Let's go to channels. Let's load the luminosity here by uh, command option or command or control alt two, uh, depending on if you're PC or Mac. And I'm going to create a new channel. And again, we're just going to do that whole that little song and dance again. Command or control I to invert and uh, uh, to invert the mask and just fill that with uh, black or white or whatever. I'm going to hit command or control D to deselect. So at this point, really, my adjustments they don't have to go to the sky, but the sky is the brightest part of this channel. So I need to invert the entire channel by hitting Command or Control I. Now you can see all the white down here. So if I apply this as a layer mask, we're gonna get a ton of adjustment here in our foreground, not so much in the sky. We are still gonna get quite a bit in the sky though because this ranges from like a medium gray to just darker than medium gray back to medium gray to lighter than medium gray, which means we're gonna get a lot of adjustment in terms of brightness pumped into the sky. So we need to kind of adjust our luminosity mask a little bit. Uh, let's create a series of luminosity masks here. So let's um, let's command or control click our RGB uh, channel up there. And then let's uh, let's go command shift option, control shift alt and click to kind of make that a little, you know, kind of constrict it a little bit. Create a new channel, command or control I to create that channel. Well, that's actually pretty good. Uh, let's command shift option or control shift alt click RGB once more. Create another new channel, command or control I. That's pretty good as well. Let's do it one more time here to constrict even more and great and I'm just going to command or control D to deselect so I'm just going to invert each of these uh, luminosity masks that we've created so you can see they're all varying degrees of just how much of like the clouds in the foreground they show what I'm looking for is just the perfect level of I'm going to really brighten up the foreground and not really affect the sky. Now, of course, as we make the foreground brighter and brighter, the sky also gets brighter and brighter. So I think actually for the purposes of this, we're going to stick with our original alpha channel. I'm going to turn everything back on. And these are just selections we're saving. Don't overthink it. You know, don't well, what's a channel? How does it work? All that stuff. It's just easiest to think of these in this case as a saved selection. Let's go back over to layers. Oh, I'm sorry. Let's command or control click that alpha channel. All right. And let's go back to our layers. And again, we'll slap a curves adjustment onto this. And let's begin brightening this up. So we're going to brighten it, brighten it, brighten it. Now, as I brighten it, we're going to lose a little bit of contrast. So I want to be able to pull back down on the darks to increase my contrast. But overall, I want this to be a brightening adjustment. We're really brightening up the foreground. So there's before, there's after. Look at how much the sky is being brightened, though. So one of the things that I like to do, especially in a case like this, and actually, real quick, in curves, Let's just mess around with this. Let's increase the reds maybe here in the foreground, decrease the greens a little bit, just give it like a very slight drip of magenta, and also decrease the blues just a teensy, teensy bit. It's just going to give us some great color in our foreground here. Now, one of the things that I do want to look at is uh, part of the value of this luminosity mask is, and we've explained it here, but if, uh, it, which is why it's taken as long as it has to get this luminosity mask, but if you come into a new image, just bam, select that Luma channel and create a bunch of different levels of luminosity mask and you've got it. Um, but one of the great things about this, if I zoom in here, like we need to obviously brighten the foreground. I mean, I'm zooming right back out as I zoom in. Uh, we need to brighten the foreground, but we don't really want to brighten the sky. If I shut my curves off, I can see that I still am brightening the sky a little bit. Too much, too much for my liking. I want to preserve the brightening in the foreground, get rid of the brightening in the sky. Here's the point I'm trying to make. See all this detail on the top of the trees? This is what makes it so difficult to do that. With Luminosity Mask, it selects it in seconds. If I alter option click on my mask, look at all the detail along the tree line that we have. It's so perfectly selected because uh, it's just doing it through the color channel. For, well, not really through the color channel. So much. Well, I guess, yes, through the color channels, but really through the luminosity values here in the image. Alter option click to uh, get back out of the mask, uh, the alpha channel viewing mode, back to our image. Uh, we want to get rid of the the effect that this is having on the sky. So let's we can alter option click on the mask here, or you can select the mask, and you can actually use an adjustment layer on the mask. Let's go image adjustments levels, and we can just bring the black point up. So let's bring that up, and what it's going to do is darken the sky. Now I don't like doing this in here because I can't see what it's doing to my actual image. I just want to do that so you can see it. I'm going to alter option click. Whoop, not to create a clipping mask. Let's alter option click the mask itself. I still have the mask selected. And I'm going to do the same exact thing. Image, adjustments, levels. And now I'm going to be able to tell like, hey, look, look at how much darker the sky got. Look at that. As I cut off that brightening. The sky gets much darker. I'm going to go to right about there. I don't want to do damage to my tree line. Hit OK. And you can see before and after. And like 95% of our effect is here on the foreground. Uh, so using these luminosity, ma luminosity masks, it's so helpful for selecting vast areas of shadow, highlight, midtone, or literally anywhere along the way. Uh, you can select 
any of those points using luminosity masks and just create these super elaborate, complex masks uh, really, really fast. Uh, definitely something I urge you to look into and play with because you can combine channels and use apply image and calculations. And there's so much that you can do with luminosity masks. If you're a landscape photographer, luminosity masks are an absolute must have. There's before, there's after, and we do it so fast with luminosity masks. And we can just command or control click our current mask if we want to really slag off of this and just open up uh, the brightness here of the foreground even more. Maybe correct some of those shadows a little bit. Add a little contrast back in. You can see there's before, there's after. We go in and just make huge changes to a landscape photo. And we can do it with relative ease because of luminosity masks. So I feel like if I say luminosity masks, luminosity mask one more time, I'm going to self-detonate. Uh, let's take a break here. I want to I'll let you guys know I'm selling a course over on tutvid.com. A link should appear up in the top corner of the video. If you're watching this on YouTube, it should be like a little icon with the letter I in it. Selling a course on my site. It's all about advanced retouching. Not really advanced, but just retouching photos. A, a, a variety of different ways. Beauty photography, food, landscape, just regular fashion portraiture, um, all kinds of different things. Kids. Uh, we cover all kinds of stuff in the course. Use that link, head over there, pick it up if you feel so inclined. It really helps us keep doing what we're doing here uh, at tutvid.com. Helps me crank out more and more and more videos, moving onward and upward, getting bigger, better, faster, stronger, everything like that. Let's get back to this. We're only two, two tips in. We got eight more to go, so let's make this go fast. Let's jump back over to Chelsea once more. I'm going to get rid of the curves adjustment. I want to talk about non-destructive healing and cloning and also the cloning panel. So uh, when you're using any of these tools like the clone stamp tool, right, the way it works is, hey, we can just hold down our alter option key, select from her uh, forehead there, and we can paint another eyeball into – or select her eyeball and paint it into her forehead. Of course, it helps if the opacity of the tool is turned all the way up. And you can see you're just going to kind of clone one area of your photo or image or graphic or whatever to another. Uh, the healing brush, on the other hand, it, it, it does much it, – it sort of does the same thing except that it helps try to blend in whatever you're cloning. So you can see how, yeah, sure, it's cloning the eye, but it's really trying to blend all that skin around it together. Particularly helpful here, she got this uh, – her spray tan was just wearing off. So like – like uh, I'm using my healing brush tool, the healing brush, the spot healing brush I don't use as much. Healing brush tool, you hold down alter option to uh, select a skin tone area and you can just like paint over little blemishes in the skin. It's really like magic. It just works so quick and easy. This isn't a tutorial on the healing brush tool, however. I'm going to undo that because the way I use the healing brush tool is up on a new layer. I'm going to call this blemishes. And I like to, and this is vital, you want to make sure that the sample uh, drop-down menu is set to current and below. This is going to allow you to sample from bits of the image that are not your current layer, stuff that's below. So what does this mean? Well, it means that like if she says, hey, can you just get rid of my, my little necklace? I can say, hey, yeah, sure, no problem. And I, you know, we go through, get rid of it, and, and she comes back to me a week later and says, ooh, you know what? I really kind of want that back. Well, guess what? I've saved the document. I've closed it. I've closed Photoshop. I might have gone on vacation between now and then. I can just come in here into my blemishes layer and I can get rid of the blemishes layer or mask away part of my blemishes layer or select it with the lasso tool and delete it. Point is I can get the chain back whenever I want. I can also do stuff like reduce the opacity of my blemishes layer to only kind of get rid of part of the chain. Now that doesn't make sense with something like a chain of course, but it does make sense when you're doing something like getting rid of these lines in her forehead. So I can grab my, uh, my healing brush here, alter option and sample and I can just paint over these lines. And just come through here and get rid of every little line that I can find, right? This works remarkably well on elderly folks as well. Uh, trying to get rid of the wrinkles. Hey, you know what? If you're 90, 95 years old and I can make you look like you're 85, that's, you know, that's a, that's a, great, uh, a great little adjustment to be able to make with a portrait you've shot. So we get rid of all the lines. Maybe that's not necessarily the most realistic uh, way to go about doing this. We can also get rid of the bags under the eyes, right? Unless she doesn't really have any. Uh, but... Once you've done massive change like this, you can use your opacity slider and just back it off a little bit. And really all we've done is just kind of softened those wrinkles in her forehead, right? You can see we're just softening everything up. So it just helps. Uh, it, it give, you have options is what I'm trying to say. When you do your blemish removal up on its own layer, I'm just going to select all and delete. 
uh, to get rid of everything I painted onto that layer. You, you leave yourself open to lots and lots of different options when you work in Photoshop that way. So that's the way I like to use the clone stamp tool and the healing brush tool. Now I mentioned the clone stamp panel window clone source. The reason I want to show this is because there's a very, very important little feature in here, this angle option. Let's say I want to take her hairline and get rid of this little bit uh, that's sticking out here. Uh, well, what I can do is I can use the clone stamp tool, and this might not be the best the greatest example in the world, but we're going to go with it anyway. I'm going to just select her hair here, and I can make my brush bigger, and I can see that if I were to just start painting, the hair is still moving in this direction. I need the hair to be moving either like straight up and down or over in that direction. So I can use my rotate feature here, and you can see I'm getting this little overlay of kind of how much the image is rotating. And I can see when I'm going to paint, it's almost going to be more straight up and down. It has to be rotated even more, though. Let's go 40, 50 degrees. There we go, something like that. And I can just paint the hair in just like that. And we've kind of automatically applied this rotation, which is going to allow us to sort of correct that hairline a little bit. Now, the color and blending of it is absolutely hideous, and really we should probably bring her hair out more than take it in. But the fact is, you can use this little angle adjustment as you're cloning. This is super helpful if you're working on a horizon line, and there's maybe a little mountain or a bump, and you just need to like rotate the tool a little bit. You can do it so quickly and so easily with the angle option in the clone source panel. So that's how I like to use the clone stamp tool and the healing brush tool. Let's stay here with Chelsea. Moving on to the fourth thing that I think you should know how to do, targeting subtleties in skin tone and colors, uh, specifically in skin tone, uh, is something that can be really, really helpful if you're photographing somebody who has very red skin or maybe they got too much of a tan. Uh, could be helpful in getting rid of the remnants of her tan uh, that, are, that are very, very noticeable. Uh, but the way that I like to do this, the way that I typically do it most is with the hue saturation adjustment layer. So let's select hue saturation here. And what we can do is right off the bat, we can try just choosing like reds and see what happens when we desaturate. You can see it does all kinds of horrible things. And I actually would probably urge you to avoid just desaturating, uh, especially when you're working with skin tones. Usually the issue is a matter of hue. There's a little bit too much red or it's a little too pink. You can shift it back. So if there's a little bit too much redness, uh, you can you can you know, shift it a little bit here toward the orange or shift it. And I'm saying shifting it toward the orange because the center point is really working with the colors down here. So if I pull it to the left, it's going to give me more orange yellow. If I pull it to the right, it's going to me more pink, right? So I just got more pink, more orange. So, but this would be something that's a very subtle adjustment. One, two, three ticks in either direction. You can see there's before, there's after. So we just help neutralize some of that greenish, uh, yellowish cast in her skin. In fact, we can even go to yellows and say, look, hey, yellows, we really want you to be a little bit closer to like a reddish orange color than her skin. All right. So you can see there, if I pull it toward the greens, we're getting this crazy greenness. Uh, or we really want it to be more in the, the direction of red. So let's go like negative five there. You can see before and after. And we're just changing her skin tone. We're really not messing with much of the rest of the photo. Now, that does beg the question, what if there's a big giant red car behind her? Well, what you can do, because this is an adjustment layer, you can mask everything. So you can fill the adjustment layer with black, Commander Control i and just use your brush tool and paint with white over, let's say, areas that you know are definitely skin tone, like her face and here at the top of her chest and her neck, uh, maybe underneath the dress a little bit where you can see her skin through the sleeves. We could paint in those areas and that will ensure that we're still affecting uh, the image. So the mask is telling us, hey, work on the skin tone area roughly and the color options within hue saturation are specifically targeting reds, yellows, you know, magentas. You can go into magenta even. Now a way that you can get even more uh, refined, and this is just to throw a quick side tip into here, we can right click and convert our image to a smart object. Uh, we can go filter, camera raw filter. Now here in camera raw, we can go over to the HSL sliders, and HSL gives us a couple more sliders. So we get reds, oranges, oranges in addition to yellow, and there's going to be a lot of orange in your skin tone, right? I can shift my hue. I can shift the saturation. I can shift the luminance or the brightness of it, and I've got my aquas and purples, and so I've got some additional options here in uh, the camera raw editor. I can hit OK after I've made a change. Because it's a smart object, I can always double click, go back into it, and also because it's a smart filter, uh, I can use this layer mask and do exactly what we did here with hue saturation where I fill it with black and I just paint over her skin tones to just make my camera raw HSL adjustment attack her skin tones and 
you know, work with skin tones, work around skin tones. It's all about subtleties and skin tones. Um, you can make huge changes and do a lot of good to your images by just tweaking and adjusting those subtleties. But a lot of, sometimes you'll just have somebody who's, you know, I've got a crazy red sunburn on my face and I just, you know, I, I can you lessen it? Can you just make it maybe not quite so red? This is how you're going to go in there and do it. Target the reds. Use the tools that Photoshop gives us to target the reds and work with that color specifically. Really helpful, really fast, and so cool when you get the hang of it. And actually, before I go on, I should mention here in hue saturation, when you're working with this, like here in the reds channel, you can use these little eyedroppers and say like, look, I want to select, uh, I want to keep adding to the reds and oranges that I'm selecting. You can just go through and kind of expand how much of this color you're selecting. You can do it manually or you can use these color eyedroppers and you can just expand or contract. You can say, look, I really don't want to mess with skin tones that match the stuff up here on our forehead. You can see it contracts the area of hue that we would be swinging uh, when we do something like that. So that's just a little uh, tip for using hue saturation uh, and the hue saturation adjustment layer in general. All right, so next up, we're going to talk about face replacement. We're going to take this girl, and we're going to put this guy's face onto her. So we're back to this guy once more. Here's how we do this. Um, actually, this is a technique that a buddy of mine, Jesus Ramirez, from uh, Photoshop Training Channel, great guy. Jesus, I wish you were here on the East Coast. I'm sure we'd hang out a lot more, but Philadelphia is uh, about 3,000 miles away from Oakland. Anyway, this is a technique that I learned from him. It's got to be the best technique out there. It's just amazing. Let me run through it really, really quickly. Uh, you grab the lasso tool and cut the face out, which you're looking to paste in place. So I'm just going to use my lasso tool here. Ba-boom, cut that out. Go to my background there. Commander Control J, pop it up onto its own layer. Grab my move tool, and I'm going to drag it bring it right here over to the girl layer. Now, it's always, you know, best practice to work with a face probably that's going to be bigger than the face that you're, you know, like his face is much bigger than hers. So I've got a lot of data I'm working with. It's bigger than the one I'm pasting over. I'm going to reduce the opacity of his face and I'm going to, you know, move this so his eyebrow or his eye really is over her uh, eye over there. And I'm going to hit Command or Control T to free transform. Move my center point into the middle of his eye and hold down Shift and Option. This will be Shift and Alt on the PC and just scrub the size of the face down. We really want to make sure the face is small enough that it fits on her face. It's going to look really weird, like if the lips are way down here and her chin is, you know, a quarter of an inch away from the edge of the lips. Not going to look realistic at all. So you got to get the sizing right. I think that's about good. In fact, I'm going to lift this up. I'm really watching the lips here. That's going to help sell it, even if the face is a little bit taller than hers, because I can always like squish it down a little bit. I can even make it a little bit narrower. Uh, we can we can rotate it. Whoop! I double click this Commander Control T again. We can rotate it a little bit. Kind of move it right right where you think it needs to be to move it into place. There we go. And I, I should also add, this is a nice photo to work on because her hair is out of her face. I can see her entire face. Um, the photo of him is great because, yeah, his hair is out of his face. I can see his entire face. So it's going to work well. With the face layer here, and I can just name the layer face. There we go. Increase the opacity back to 100%. Now what we need to do is match the color. So we need to make sure that he is going to kind of sort of blend in a little bit. So I'm going to command or control click on the face and it's important that we do that because we just want to select colors really within her face right within this selection here that we're going to use to match his face to her face we're going to use the command image adjustments match color and here in match color we got to do a couple things first we got to say hey source we want it to be girl that's the name of our document girl.jpg and the layer specifically is going to be background because we're copying color from her to him okay and now this is really bad it's super blown out and bright and colorful and all kinds of stuff that I don't want it to be so I'm going to tone down the color intensity uh, a bit I'm also going to tone the luminance back 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 a little bit and then I'm going to begin to fade it a little bit I don't really use neutralize that kind of you know, for all intents and purposes, makes it uh, black and white. I'm going to keep fading it here until it looks about right. Let me increase the luminance just a touch. Something like that looks good. And uh, here in the image statistics, I've got use selection and source to calculate the colors and also the selection and target to calculate the adjustment. That's why I loaded the face as a selection. Hit OK. And we're going to have our face colorized nicely. Now, before we do anything else, let's go select, modify, contract, and just contract this selection by 10 you know, 5, 10, 15, 20 pixels. Um, this all has to do with the size of your photo. 10 or 15 pixels works with most 
reasonably high resolution photos. Go ahead and hit OK. It's going to pull the selection back. We need to deselect now. So Command or Control D to deselect. Select the background image and hit Command or Control J to duplicate it. Now remember I just had that selection. We can go select, reselect. It's going to bring back that little selection. Uh, let's hide our background layer and we're going to hide the face. So now we just have her selected. I'm going to hit the delete key. It's going to punch a hole right through her face. Command or Control D to deselect. And now we're going to use this face to sort of bridge the gap, if you will. You can see, we can see a little bit of her eyebrow. We can clean that up with like our he good old healing brush tool or something. And he's got facial hair. There's a lot of problems here. Uh, realistically speaking, the texture of his skin isn't nearly as smooth as hers. Um, all kinds of stuff like that. We're going to suspend that. Uh, we're going to suspend our judgment on that for a moment. Now with these two layers, we're going to select face, hold down shift, select that background, and we're going to go edit auto blend layers and in here I'm going to choose panorama seamless tones and colors content aware fill transform uh, transparent areas and hit OK I'm going to give Photoshop just a moment here and you're going to see it's going to blend this face in uh, kind of scarily good uh, it gives you this new layer that's merged and on this layer we can do some things like get rid of that little bit of nonsense there I'm not even going to create a new layer for this because this isn't really a serious project but you can see uh, I can get rid of that little bit of something something up there I can get rid of that really hard edge there and just help kind of smooth things and then of course I mean it's ridiculous because he has you know facial hair and she had this beautiful smooth skin um, and you know you can just go around and, and and smooth any edges now the edges are gonna just they're super pronounced because the faces are so different but just imagine if you're using this and you have maybe a, a one portrait a session that you photographed and somebody's blinking on one photo you need to swap their face in the other look at how can you imagine how amazing this would be if this guy was photographed standing right next to her under the same light and all the same conditions and everything it would be amazing so I can just shut this off and you can see there's before there's after auto blend did do some funky stuff with the background uh, what you can do is in order to save the merged face just apply a filled layer mask so layer layer mask hide all and then we would just take our brush tool and paint with white just over the face and we would just show that blended face uh, over top of her and that would maintain your the integrity of your background and everything like that there's before there's after and you can see it does a really really impressive job even though this face is just massively different uh, than what we were working on before it's actually pretty frightening looking all right, let's get away from that terrifying facial replacement thing that we just did. Uh, Chicago, let's talk about color technique. Chicago, one of my favorite cities here in the United States. And this photo shot over the river, very, very blue. It's very blue. Um, so one of the things we can do just quickly to correct color is do something like slap a curves adjustment layer on this and grab this middle eyedropper, the gray eyedropper, and just select something in the image that we know should be gray, like this concrete little edge probably should be gray. Let's click it, and you can see just how much that warms and cleans things up. Uh, we could do something like, oh, maybe, you know, at the side of this building should be gray. And, well, it doesn't really do much of a difference beyond that because it's already really, really corrected a lot. I can try down here. It's going to add a little bit of green to it. I don't really like that. And you can just see a quick before and after. Now, this is a fairly easy image to correct because, like, you know, concrete is probably going to be gray. We have all the gray over there. And gray doesn't have color in it. So if the gray has, like, a heavy blue color cast, well, the rest of the image probably has a heavy blue color cast because that's how color works. Uh, let's talk about about an image here like happy couple where maybe it's a little bit more difficult to find just an obviously gray point like we don't know if that wall was actually gray when we photographed this scene or not now you can use something called a gray card which the subject would just hold up and you know there's a box there that absolutely 100% should be gray and you can just use this gray eyedropper boom click and you've color corrected your image sometimes you don't have the luxury of doing that and here's how you correct images and help find the gray point within the image what you do is create a new layer and then you go edit fill and we fill this layer with 50% gray next we set this layer to the blend mode of difference I'm gonna grab my eyedropper tool I've got a little sampler down here I'm just gonna shift drag that to get rid of it and I'm gonna show you exactly what I'm doing here next I'm going to apply a threshold uh, threshold adjustment layer so remember we got 50% gray set to the difference uh, blend mode now here on threshold I'm gonna double click and I'm gonna pull the threshold level way back until I'm just seeing like the first bits of black happening so like right there is probably where the first bit of black comes through so I'm gonna zoom in on that little bit grab my eyedropper tool and I'm gonna shift click to drop a little crosshair there 
I'm going to just close my information panel and I can shut off my threshold and my 50% gray layer. And I've got that little bit of area to click on. And what I do now is grab my like curves adjustment layer, grab that middle gray eyedropper and click right in there and zoom out. And what we should get is an image that neutralizes. Now it looks very blue, but we're neutralizing that greenish yellowish color cast. And you can see it's pretty effective. If we don't like it, well, the first thing I would encourage you to do is just hang tight for a second because your eyes will adjust to it. And now if we go from this very blue image back to this greenish yellowish one, this looks really bad. But this didn't look that bad when we first opened it, did it? Color correcting can be tricky, which is why it's nice to be able to do a little bit of color correction kind of by the numbers because it can be helpful to lean on Photoshop a little bit as your eyes are sort of trying to self-correct. Uh, Photoshop will help you out. And if you still think it's just too blue, you can just always reduce the opacity a little bit and mingle the two a little and get a nice balanced image uh, out of uh, your little color correction uh, technique process or whatever you want to call it. So moving along from color correction, or speaking of color, I should say, let's talk about vibrance and saturation. So let's add a vibrance adjustment layer. This is going to be a quick one. What's the difference between vibrance and saturation? It's pretty important. Well, if we increase saturation, saturation increases everything with reckless disregard. It doesn't care about skin tones, colors, where it's doing what. It just boosts the saturation overall, which is a great thing. Uh, but in a, an image like this, we've got these people and like her skin, it looks like she's been put in the microwave and him, it looks like he slept on the tanning bed overnight. Uh, so we want to just set the uh, saturation back to zero. Vibrance, on the other hand, boosts saturation, but it lends some respect to skin tones. Now you can see these people still look a little half baked uh, because like they're getting a lot of this greenish, orangish reflected light from their environment. You know, this, this, you know, light from the walls and maybe the plant or whatever out of the plants, probably not big enough to reflect that much light, but they're getting a lot of reflected light, but you can see a huge difference between vibrance and saturation. So something sometimes I like to do is boost vibrance a lot, like 50, 60%, and then reduce overall saturation a little bit. It can give you a really nice mixture of colors and just kind of pull back on some colors that need to be dulled a little bit while still boosting uh, the, the color and tone of some, well, really not the tone, but just the color of some of the images, uh, some of the areas of your image. So make sure you play around with the vibrance and saturation sliders and use them together. There's nothing that says you can only use one or the other. You can always mix it up. You can boost saturation and reduce vibrance, for instance, um, and see what kind of effect you can get. Um, and maybe if that works better with the color in your particular photo, they're very practical uses uh, for that when you're using saturation uh, or vibrance uh, here in Photoshop. Let's move on to number eight. This is something that's pretty cool. Let's actually jump over to this photo here. Let's say I, I'm sharpening this image, but I want to reduce the noise uh, that's out in these big open areas. I'm going to use camera raw sharpening uh, because it allows me to really hone in my masking. Now, something like Filter, Sharpen, Smart Sharpen does have this reduce noise feature, which is going to allow you to kind of kill off noise in these, you know, massive areas of lots of solid color where applying a ton of sharpening will do nothing but sharpen the noise in those areas. There, there can be a more kind of visual way to do this, though. We're going to use Camera Raw Editor, as I mentioned a moment ago. I'm going to convert this to a smart object. It's just kind of force of habit when I'm using the Camera Raw Filter. Filter. Camera Raw Filter right here. And here in the Camera Raw Editor, I'm going to come over here to Sharpening. Now, I can just apply a bunch of sharpening, and it's going to sharpen her up and all that good stuff. It's also sharpening the noise. Now, I have this masking slider here. If I hold down my Alt or Option key while I slide the masking slider, it's going to show me the areas that will no longer have a huge amount of sharpening applied to them. They're solid black, whereas all those white lines lines and stuff all over her, that stuff is still going to be sharpened very nicely. So I can keep dragging this until I feel that I've sufficiently sharpened her while not applying a wayward sharpening to these large areas of just blank color that all it's going to do is sharpen up uh, that noise. Now you can also hold your Alt or Option key here when you're adjusting the detail level and also the radius detail so you can really see uh, the area kind of on either side of contrasting edges where the camera roll editor will look when you're sharpening up your image. So make sure you just try different sliders. I mean there's all kinds of sliders in here that if you hold down the Alt or Option key you're going to get a different view and it's going to allow you to get a preview of some sort of what you're doing when it comes to sharpening and noise reduction and things Things like that really really helpful and it will allow you to get really really beautiful sharpening uh, when you're sharpening using the camera raw filter so let's move along to number nine and this is well we're gonna use this portrait here of her uh, this is selective sharpening 
I like to use high pass sometimes for sharpening. And when I do use high pass for sharpening, this is how I like to do, especially with portraits. Um, now, like her face, I don't necessarily want sharpened to the same degree as her hair and her hair, maybe not to the same degree as this bit of her sweater here in the foreground. How do we change this? Well, here's what I do first. I command or control, well, I, I create a duplicate of my image. Now, if I have a bunch of layers and a bunch of different things going on in here, uh, whoops, like this, you know, what I'll often do is, well, we don't want the black and white layer, uh, is I will merge everything to a new layer hit, holding down Command, Shift, Option, or Control, Shift, Alt, and hit the letter E. It gives me this composite of all of my layers, and this would be my sharpen layer. It's really just a layer from which I'm going to make selections, though. So here with the sharpen layer selected, we're going to enter into quick mask mode, but before we really do anything in quick mask mode, double click on the quick mask icon and make sure you have selected areas ticked on. Not masked areas, but selected areas. Hit OK. Now, we're going to select quick mask mode to enter into it once more. Grab the brush tool. I want a nice, large, soft edge brush. Make it a little smaller. I'm just painting with black. This is going to be the selection for her face. It can be very rough. Does not at all have to be perfect. We're going to go over, paint all over her face because her face is going to be sharpened up uh, in just a moment here. I'm going to hit the letter Q. It's going to load that as a selection. Great. I'm going to go select, modify, feather. And I'm going to feather this, I don't know, let's go like 100 pixels. Something pretty substantial. And I'm going to hit Command or Control J. What does it do? Well, it pops this very soft edged bit of the image up onto its own layer. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to use this to create a high pass uh, adjustment. So I'm going to convert this to black and white, Command, Shift, or Control, Shift, U, and then go filter, other, high pass. And here with this, I'm going to maybe give it a radius of 2.2, something like that. Looks pretty good. Hit OK. And I can set this to a blend mode. Well, let's turn the underlying image back on. Set this to a blend mode of something like soft light. So what we've done is we've just applied sharpening to her face. And using that same technique, jump into quick mask mode, grab your brush. You could paint over her hair and you know soften the edges of that. You could paint over her shirt, soften the edges of that, and so on and so forth. And selectively sharpen your image till the cows come home. And you, you get to sharpen every little bit exactly as you wish. And you don't have to worry about one giant global overall sharpening adjustment uh, and living or dying by that. Let's move on to number 10, the last of the quick tips for photographers. I say quick tips. This is going to be a long video, though. Uh, the last of the quick tips for photographers, and this is using camera raw to create finishing grain in your image. So a lot of times photographers will add grain intentionally to images because it helps blend adjustments you've made. It gets rid of like banding and images. If you're really having to push or pull an image, you start to get color banding, add a little bit of grain, add a little bit of noise. It's going to help alleviate some of that. Here's how I use Camera Raw because Camera Raw's grain is so much nicer than the noise filter here in Photoshop. Create a new layer. I'm going to name it Grain. It doesn't have to be named Grain, but, you know, I'm trying to be a little, little more organized. Uh, grain, and I'm going to go Edit, Fill, and I'm going to choose to fill it with 50% gray. Great. Next, we're going to go Filter, Camera Raw Filter. And here in the Camera Raw Filter, we just go over here to the FX tab, and we choose the amount of grain we want. So we can go grain. We can choose the size of the grain. We can make it really soft or really crunchy. I'm going to go really soft, like poofy grain. There we go. Hit OK. And now all we do is we set it to a blend mode of either overlay or soft light, soft light, and we get this beautiful, soft, very organic looking grain. I can reduce the opacity if I like. And this grain would blend together color and retouching and skin tone and so many things so beautifully. It's so fast and it's so easy. Uh, and, and, and by the way, if I converted my gray layer to a smart object, I would be able to go into the camera raw editor and edit this grain a hundred times, a thousand times if I wanted to, as many times as I wanted to, and it would all be there for me uh, to work with. So that's going to be it for this one. If you enjoyed the video, please leave a little like on it. Also, if you feel so inclined, drop a comment below. Subscribe to my channel so you never miss another Photoshop or photography or Lightroom video or tutorial or anything that has to do with picking up a camera and taking a picture. So for 10 quick tips, or maybe not so quick tips, for 10 just tips in Photoshop, ranging from luminosity masks to selective sharpening and grain with camera raw, that is it. Get it, got it, good. Nathaniel Dodson, cutvid.com. I'll catch you in the next one.